Друзья, сегодня мы начинаем новый формат видео на нашем канале. Это беседы, интервью с иностранными политиками, депутатами, общественными деятелями. Разговаривать будем о том, что ближе всего россиянам. Это война в Украине, это санкции, это возможность налаживания нормальных отношений, когда для этого представится политическая возможность, и вообще отношения иностранцев к России и к россиянам. И начинаем мы с легенды, живой легенды британской политики Джереми Корбина. Он действующий депутат Палаты общин, парламента Великобритании. Вы знаете, Великобритания это парламентская монархия, и там парламент определяет буквально все. И ранее он был лидером лейбористской партии, и до этого еще лидером ее социалистического крыла. Uh, Mr. Coburn, first of all, uh, let me congratulate you with your re-election in the House of Commons. And I think that uh, the British people are uh, very lucky uh, that they have such defender in their parliament. Well, thank you very much. I stood as an independent because the Labour Party refused to allow me to be uh, even considered as a Labour candidate. So it was an issue of democracy. And in my election campaign, which we won with uh, just about half of all the votes in my constituency, I stood for peace, I stood for redistribution of power and wealth, for environmental sustainability, and above all, for social justice, for housing, decent wages, and public ownership of the major utilities that serve our community. It was a very strong manifesto, and we are now developing local forums that I will be accountable to all the time I'm a member of parliament. We're developing a new form of popular democracy. Okay, uh, Mr. Corbyn, you have uh, repeatedly opposed the arm supplies, uh, the, uh, the arm supplies uh, from West to Ukraine. And can you explain why? I think that the war in Ukraine, between Russia and Ukraine, is absolutely appalling more than half a million people are already dead as a result of this war and they are soldiers from Ukraine, they're soldiers from Russia, they're civilians on both sides and it is a disaster, a disaster for the economies of both countries and a disaster for the economies wider than that. I do not support Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I've always called for a ceasefire and negotiations to bring about the future. If both sides can come together to agree on grain shipments, they can come together to agree on a future. And my sadness has been that none of the Western powers, United States, Britain, France, Germany, any others, have ever said or done anything about peace. All they've done is seen it as an opportunity to export more and more weapons to Ukraine and the power of the arms industry to influence this is huge and so I've said we should stop the arms supplies and start a process of negotiation with Russia. It doesn't support or condone what Russia has done but it helps to end the killing. I entirely agree with you. Thank you for your position. And uh, what can you say about the uh, sanction policy of Western against Russia? Uh, don't you think that it uh, lacks clear and understandable criteria for lifting sanctions? I want to see a world where we don't have sanctions against um, each other. I don't think it actually helps trade or helps the living standards of people and um, indeed the issues of energy supplies have been enormous the issue of food supplies are also enormous i see the people of russia as the people of ukraine as my friends not my enemies and uh, a, a, i want to see a process of um, ceasefire of a recognition of a peace process and an end to sanctions. Uh, due to the sanctions, due to the arms supplies uh, to Ukraine, uh, many Russian citizens think that uh, everyone uh, in the West are opposed to them. Uh, is it really so? No, not really. Um, the relationship of the people of my country with Russia goes back a very long way. After the Soviet Revolution, 
in uh, 1920, for example, the then British government tried to export a huge quantity of armaments to Russia, but the white forces in Russia, to oppose the Russian Revolution. The working class communities of the East End of London, Glasgow and other places, refused to allow those weapons to go on ships. They never went. And the want the wanting of a proper relationship with the Soviet Union happened eventually in 1924 when the Soviet Union was recognized and yes there was the Cold War period obviously but in the Second World War it was um, British tanks that were used by the Red Army in the Battle of Moscow that had been brought there at great risk by sailors going to Murmansk and so that relationship is a long-standing and a, a, a very old one. Everybody in Britain is not hatred or opposing Russia, not a bit of it. They recognize that they are people that have gone through huge convulsions in their society, particularly with the um, uh, Yeltsin period in 1990, which caused so much devastation and havoc to the poorest people in Russia and still does. People want to have decent relations with others. They don't see the Russian people as enemies. They don't agree with the war in Ukraine. It doesn't mean they, doesn't mean they hate the Russian people. Uh, so do you mean that after some political changes uh, in Russia, we will have an opportunity to resume n normal uh, interaction? I want that normal interaction to resume, and I work with and support the Voices for Peace in Russia. My good friend Boris Kargalitsky should not be in prison. He should be out and able to speak out. I've done many events and meetings with him. He's a voice to me of the people of Russia. Oh, I will write about it, uh, Boris Kogelitsky, in letter. Uh, Please do. And send him my very best personal regards, as well as the solidarity of all of the peace movement in Britain to Boris Kogel and all the other peace activists in Russia who want to see an end to the war and want to see decent, normal relations. And they want the Western leaders to speak out for peace, not just exporting weapons. Uh, what do you think about uh, NATO expansion? I have never been in favor of um, NATO expansion. I Historically, I think a great opportunity was missed in 1990 when the Warsaw Pact collapsed and finally wound itself up. That was a time for other military alliances to do the same. NATO instead carved for itself, particularly at the Lisbon summit in 2006, a Lisbon uh, NATO summit, a um, global role. And I think that is a problem that NATO has now decided that all member states have got to spend 2.5% of their economy, their GDP, on arms expenditure. That's massive. That's a massive amount. In the case of Britain, it will mean another 30 billion pounds per year on arms expenditure. And uh, the more you spend on arms, the more likely they are to be used. And so I want to see a reduction in military alliances and an increase in peaceful alliances. Why do we spend so much more on NATO than we do on the United Nations and its peacekeeping operations? Okay. Uh, to, to the situation in uh, Great Britain. In the last election in Great Britain, the Labour Party uh, had a great victory, and uh, you uh, had this party for uh, five years. And uh, so, do you expect now some changes uh, in the political of the uh, government? Well, the Labour Party did achieve a big parliamentary majority, that is absolutely true, and did defeat the Tory government, that is absolutely true. However, the number of people that actually voted for the Labour Party was less in the 2024 election than in the previous election, previous two general elections. So it wasn't a great victory for the Labour Party. The manifesto on which they fought the election was very weak very weak on questions of public ownership, of redistribution of power and wealth, and the elimination of poverty within our society. And um, whilst I obviously welcome the end of the Conservatives, my worry is it's the Reform Party of the far right, of Nigel Farage, that gained four million votes. And like in other parts of Europe, 
It's the right that are exploiting the poverty of working class communities and the failure of the social democrats and socialist parties to offer an alternative. In the case of Britain, working class community living standards have fallen by 20% in the past decade. Mm -hmm. And the left has to have an answer to that. Yes, I oppose the rise of the far right, obviously. I hate those people and what they stand for and what they do. But if we don't have an economic alternative as well, then people who are desperate are going to listen to them. <coughs> and uh, the last question may be, uh, what are the main demands of the working class towards uh, the government in Great Britain? A number. One, an end to the anti-trade union laws in Britain, which restrict the right, of the, power, uh, the right to strike and a number of other issues. Secondly, an end to the discrimination against children in large families. Thirdly, um, an increase in the living standards of the oldest and the poorest people in the community and in the, and in the minimum wage. And above all, a big investment in council and social housing programs, because the housing crisis is acute in Britain at the present time with an unregulated private rented sector and an insufficient supply of public housing. And so those are the basic demands. And through the Peace and Justice Project, we've put forward the five demands, which are including of those issues. And our Peace and Justice Project, which has 60,000 followers, is promoting all of these issues and bringing the left together uh, to ensure that we have a future which is a demanding real redistribution of wealth and power. Uh, thank you very much for the interview, Mr. Coburn, and I wish you good luck. It's my pleasure. It's lovely to meet you here. And my greetings to the peace-loving Russian people. I want to see an end to the war. I want to see an end to the militarism. And it's up to us as peoples, whatever language we speak, coming together. Thank you very much for your position. Thank you. Для чего мы вообще выпускаем эти видео? Я вижу две основных цели. Первое – это разрушить миф пропаганды о том, что на Западе якобы все против россиян, и что у нас нет с вами никакого другого выбора, кроме как сплотиться вокруг Владимира Путина и воевать с Западом. На самом деле ничего подобного, и сегодня мы одно из подтверждений увидели э, в словах Джереми Корбина. И второй момент, который важен, нам важно налаживать – связи с иностранными политиками, депутатами на разных уровнях, потому что после того, как все это черное безвременье, когда война в Украине, все это закончится, нам нужно будет работать, эффективно работать над тем, чтобы снимать санкции, чтобы в Россию вернулись западные технологии, чтобы просто вернулись, вернулось нормальное взаимодействие, чтобы россияне могли нормально ездить по всему миру и не чувствовать себя какими-то изолированными изгоями. Для этого нужны контакты с иностранными политиками, и мы работаем для того, чтобы их налаживать.